Hello, everybody. Welcome back to an exciting and important episode of Ask the Expert. Today's topic is near and dear to my heart because despite the fact that we have effective treatments for depression, it's estimated that up to 85% of people in low and middle income families never receive help. That's more than 264 million affected by depression, and it's the leading cause of disability in the world. We know that women are affected by depression more than men, so we've brought you the go-to expert for depression, anxiety, and women's health, Dr. Diana Samuel. She is a psychiatrist running a very busy private practice at Columbia Doctors in Midtown Manhattan. She is trained in psychodynamic psychotherapy and actively works with families in helping them cope with mental illness in a loved one. You may recognize her name as she's cited in media outlets frequently and she contributes on mental health. Dr. Samuel has been featured in places like the Daily News, U.S. News and World Report, People Magazine, Health Magazine, and Housekeeping. We are so grateful to have her here with us today. Thank you, Dr. Samuel, for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So I just want to dive in because I know that this topic, as you know, it affects so many people and there's so much unknown. Can you help by just by starting out, what's the difference between a side effect and an adverse effect? And why does it matter? Great question. So a side effect is a secondary unwanted effect that can occur during d- d- due to a drug therapy versus an adverse event is an unintended effect that can occur from a medication that's administered correctly. So a misconception is often that they're the same thing, that an adverse event and a side effect are the same thing. Let me give an example. Um, the COVID vaccine, I think this is one that we can all kind of relate or have a sense of what goes on with the vaccine. A side effect from the COVID vaccine might be that you might get a little pain, a little swelling, um, maybe a little redness at the site of where the injection goes into your arm. An adverse event would be with the COVID vaccine would be if you have a severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis or any kind of um, reaction of that. So it's much more extreme usually, and it's an adverse event at that point. That's not a side effect. So there is quite a bit of a difference between the two. It's so interesting, and it's something that comes up a lot. So thank you for clarifying it. So here's another question that we've heard quite a bit about, which is we've heard that MDMA, otherwise known as ecstasy, can be helpful for depression and other psychiatric conditions. Is it true? I mean, we is it dangerous? I mean, we hear all kinds of things as it's a club drug. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so MDMA, um, you know, it has been touted recently as being potentially helpful for depression and other psychiatric conditions like PTSD, for example. So MDMA, amongst other things, are being researched. So I can say that MDMA works by increasing three brain chemicals. The brain chemicals we think of are serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. So if you think of a serotonin, that's the one that affects mood and behavior. So we often think of it with depression because it's a neurotransmitter that helps relay signals from one part of the brain to another. And high levels of serotonin can be linked with elevated mood and feeling happy. So you can imagine why an MDMA, when it works on serotonin, can make people potentially feel better if they suffer from depression. And the other question you asked about, is it, a, is, is it a club drug? Is it dangerous, MDMA? For sure. You know, MDMA used as a club drug can be very dangerous because you could imagine, first of all, there's other things that are often mixed with MDMA ecstasy. It's not often purely that that you're receiving if you're buying it off the street. Um, and the second you know, issue is that it has a high potential for abuse and addiction. So you can imagine if you're purchasing or using these things recreationally, it could actually cause another issue or other issues in your life um, that could be more problematic potentially. So yes, there is, you know, there is potential that it might be used for depression, but just also know that we don't have um, we have very little information about the long-term effects of using MDMA. Also, we just just don't know how it could affect memory or brain function. So, it's just it's on the early stages of knowing that kind of information. So, I want to hesitantly say yes, there is potential that it could help. I really appreciate that because you know you hear both sides of it, um, and it's good to know that there are some benefits and there are some risks, and that we're still it's still TBD. We still have some uh, quite a bit of research to do before we kind of figure these things out. And as we know that you know addiction um, is so high right now, being extra careful seems like that makes a lot of sense. So on that note, moving along. 
One of the things that we also hear a lot about is ketamine. And can you help us understand, like, what is ketamine and its nasal spray, esketamine, and why would that matter to me? Ketamine is, again, like you said, it's it's one of these drugs that people have used recreationally. And so people are really interested when they hear ketamine as being used for treat. Um, depression, for example, it's ketamine is a hip is a drug that can be used that has hypnotic analgesic and amnetic effects. So meaning that you'll see other specialties using it for pain, even because ketamine can have those kind of benefits. Ketamine basically just to break it down very quickly is it has two enantiomers, meaning that it has an S ketamine, which is the one we think of for nasal ketamine, S ketamine, and there's an R ketamine to break it down much more simply is, is that S ketamine works by binding to Um, what we think of as um, an NMDA receptor antagonist, and it blocks glutamate. The reason why ketamine can work for depression, unlike antidepressants, and that is because it's working on a different pathway than many of our typical antidepressants are. So oftentimes we go to ketamine these days for treatment refractory depression. Those patients that have tried the things that we consider as typical courses of action for depression, like the antidepressants, et cetera, et cetera. And then if that doesn't work, we say, hey, let's give ketamine a try as maybe that's a potential option to treat their depression. Let me just, sorry. No. And the exciting part about S-ketamine, the nasal ketamine spray, is, is that it got approved by the FDA in March of 2019 as a treatment for treatment of refractory depression. But this past August 2020, it came out with the indication to treat suicidal ideation or behavior. So it's had that added layer of benefit now in patients that are not only depressed, but might be suffering for suicidal in, uh, suicidal thoughts and behaviors. So it's an added layer for those people that are at higher risk, we think of with depression and treating them. So it's really nice to know we have this as a potential option. I I, I really appreciate that. We, you know, we at PsychEP have been working very closely. I don't know why we call it treatment resistant depression. <laughs> and um, but I like refractory. That's probably the more professional, the right term, but it's it's really been interesting to watch that that growth of of it um, and just seeing how how patients have so many different options for them or that at least they have options. And um, I think that that's such a great sign that we have new new medications in the mix that we didn't have. And maybe, you know, you had shock therapy before and now we have other ways to, to do things. And so I agree that is very, it's a very exciting um, uh, kind of path forward for us in a new type of, of medications. So on the conversation of medications, if you take an antidepressant like Prozac, Paxil, um, Cymbalta, Lexapro, you know, one of those as a treatment for your depression, will it change your personality? I love that question about whether antidepressants can change your personality because I so often hear this in practice. I hear this from people that have never been on medications or, or have heard things from people that they wonder about whether taking a medication might be an option for them. So that's a myth. In and itself, an antidepressant is not going to change your personality. Rarely an antidepressant, and I'm going to highlight that word rarely again, is, is that it can cause what we refer to as affective blunting, which in more common words is apathy or loss of emotion. So this can sometimes happen with antidepressants. And again, it's rare. But what happens is if we hear as doctors about this happening with our patients, what we do is usually we lower the dosage or we switch to another antidepressant if lowering the dosage is impossible. And when you do one of those two courses of action, usually that goes away. So again, like I said, it won't change your personality. If anything, people that take an antidepressant, oftentimes what they notice is they feel more like themselves rather than a change. They feel like the person they used to be before they started becoming severely depressed or anxious. That's that's very very helpful. And I know that that is such a common question that people ask or a fear that they have. Does having both anxiety and depression at the same time affect your choice of treatment? And if so, how? So anxiety and depression are comorbid, meaning that they can occur at the same time in a huge number of our population, actually. Some estimate that it's about 60% of those with anxiety will have depression. And those numbers are similar about if you have depression, you might also suffer from anxiety. Um, While we don't know why exactly this happens together, some theories are that they have a similar biological mechanism that's happening, so they're more likely to present together at the same time. Another thought is, is that, as you can imagine with anxiety and depression, they have overlapping symptoms. So for example, sleep. Troubles with sleep can present 
when people have anxiety, but also can present when people suffer from depression. So it's really sometimes hard to know, um, you know, which came first or which is after or why it's happening that way. Um, but we can say is, is that treatment can really work for these people so that just because you suffer from depression, anxiety, you might think, oh man, it's not going to, nothing's going to work because now I have two issues going on. It can be more challenging for sure in some people and thinking much more about what other options potentially to help someone other than medications is usually the way we go when we're treating both. If medications alone don't work, for example, maybe I, I start an antidepressant for someone their depression improves, but they still have some anxiety. And then maybe at that time I say, hey, you need to see a therapist for cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT might help with your anxiety. And often the combination can make a huge difference. So again, the treatment options might just vary, but medications can be quite effective for people suffering from depression and anxiety. I love that because it's also personalized. So depending on kind of what, how great the needs are with different people and different needs, there's um, you know different approaches, which are a combination of evidence-based therapies and medication, which is which is great. It brings us to our next question, which we've been talking a lot about lately, treatment refractory depression um, or TRD. Is that the same thing? Treatment refractory depression is treatment resistant depression? Yes. And so will you tell us like, because we know that there are some people and you mentioned that there are some really good um, medications for, for treatment refractory depression. Are there, do these people get better? Does that mean that if it's, they're having a hard time, they're, they're never going to get better? Great question. So treatment refractory depression, TRD, like you said, um, it's, let me start by saying that depression has to meet criteria in our books by major depressive episodes. So someone has to meet DSM-5 criteria. So it's, oftentimes people say, oh, I'm suffering from depression, but they don't actually meet criteria. So if you meet criteria for depression, and it hasn't adequately responded usually to at least two antidepressants. At that point, sometimes we'll consider someone to have treatment resistant depression. So let me say the caveat to that is I'm saying that they haven't responded to two antidepressants. It means that they've tried the antidepressant at the right dosage for an adequate amount of time. So sometimes those variables are not both met. And then at that point, we may not say that it was a failed trial, like that the medication didn't work. So it is definitely, you know, something to be aware of that if you've tried a medication for long enough on the right dosage and you've tried another, and oftentimes people have tried many more than that, they might have treatment refractory depression. There's a decent amount of population of people that have treatment refractory depression it does not mean that you will not get better. And thankfully, like Marjorie was talking about earlier, the good thing is, is that there's so many cool and innovative things that are coming out on top of just medications that are really targeting this population for treatment refractory depression. So Ketamine, for example, is one of them we see, you know, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, it's been out for a long time. That's another, you know, I mean, there are definitely many more options that we're seeing in the market than it's still being researched that I think are potential options for people with treatment with factory depression. It's so good and it's so important because I think people need options now more than ever. I mean, there's nothing worse than feeling like the state that you're in is never going to end and, uh, and there is help and there is hope. And I think that is so important. And there's so many different types of options. But when people feel when people feel that they have no options, sometimes suicide is where they go to. And it's a tragic and um it's a consequence of severe untreated depression. How can I, as a friend or a relative, ask someone if she or her is thinking about taking their life? And if so, what could, would I be able to do to help? I love that you're asking about suicide because I think the questions that people often wonder when they have a loved one suffering from depression or they think that they might be suicidal is, how do I ask the question? People feel often very uncomfortable and, because they're not sure how to ask the question. So sometimes they avoid it. So the first thing is ask. You need to ask the question in order to know what the answer is. So if you're observing behaviors or signs or you're worrying that there's something that the person's experiencing, I think it's better to ask. The worst case scenario is you're incorrect and they're not feeling that. But I think asking is a first step. How you might ask, I think that also can be something you consider. You know, you might want to say it with compassion and empathy so by saying, for example, saying, you know, sometimes I know that people when they suffer from depression, they might things might get so bad that they may feel like life isn't worth living or they don't want to be here anymore. Is that something that's ever happened to you before? And I think asking the question like that really, it has a level of empathy and compassion so people can 
hopefully feel more comfortable in answering the question honestly. Um, I think also sometimes assuming that suicide might be on the menu or might be on the table is really um, a good starting point to recognize that, hey, if someone's suffering depression, there might be a good chance that they also suffer from suicidal thoughts or have had those kind of issues in the past. Using direct language, asking directly, like I said. And then I think also another um, tip I would give is, is that going into the conversation with knowing the resources. So if you're going to be asking the question, you might get an answer that then may surprise you or you may alarm you and you don't know what to do with that information. So I think coming with a toolkit of, hey, these are the numbers or resources or places that I could potentially help this person um, and provide them with is really important because I think you might ask a question and then not know what to do with it. And with suicide, especially or suicidal ideation, you really need to help that person in that moment, potentially. So I think just knowing the resources in advance um, would be really, really smart. Thank you for covering all that because, you know, at Psych Hub, we do a lot about educating about suicide and suicide prevention and how important it is to ask people because, you know, there are some people that think, oh, I don't want to ask someone because if I do, I might put that idea in their head. And we know, you know, from research that that's not the case. And I love how concrete you just put it where, you know, you ask the question and be prepared with resources. And it could be a, you know, a suicide hotline. Um and, you know, there are, you know, there are different options to, to help. And again, I think letting people know that things can get better and giving them some hope and that help works um, and they're not alone and all of those things. This was so informative. It's so interesting. I already like want to have you back on and just ask it uh, like a, a 20 more questions because I think we're just getting started on so many of the questions that people have and uh, your wealth of information. And these are, these are complicated subjects where there's a lot of misinformation out there too. So I really appreciate you coming in with such a focus and um, informed you know, information for all of these great answers for us. So thank you so much for taking the time to be on Ask the Expert with us today. Thanks so much for having me. This is really fun. As always, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed the show, drop us a review. If you haven't already, subscribe to our podcast for the latest episodes. For the latest insights, check us out at psychhub.com.